In the summer of 2024, my city installed a set of new bike lanes that made the news for being controversial. Some of the curbs separating the lanes are being damaged and there's a petition to have the lanes removed. I decided to ride the lanes myself to see what was so controversial about them. So let's discuss why my city decided to install these lanes, what are the good and bad aspects of these lanes from the perspective of someone on a bike, and why has there been a backlash against these lanes. I'll preface everything by saying these bike lanes were not built using the $100 million my city is currently spending over the next four years to accelerate the creation of an active transportation network across the city. If you want to hear more about the projects being built using that $100 million, I have two previous episodes on the topic and you can subscribe to this channel as I will have future videos as sections of infrastructure are completed. This is Hermitage Road in the northeast part of my city. You can see in Google Street View that it is quite a wide road with a 50 km an hour speed limit. Despite one direction being nearly 9 meters wide, there appear to never have been lane markings in the middle of the road indicating two travel lanes. This should mean that this road is just one travel lane and one parking lane. For context, the city's current standards for a road like this recommend a width of 6 to 7 meters. There are two zones along the road where the speed limit drops to 30 km an hour due to a nearby school or playground. For the most part, there are few residences that front onto the road and businesses have parking lots between the road and the buildings. Designing a road this wide open and expecting drivers to respect the 50 km an hour speed limit is wishful thinking. The bike lanes were installed because, in 2021, my city lowered the speed limit on residential roads to 40 km an hour. Hermitage Road should have had its speed limit reduced, but it was exempted. It was subsequently studied to determine what could be done to slow SUVs on the road. The report by the city showed that just 31% of drivers complied with the current 50 km an hour speed limit, and compliance in the playground zones was in the worst 20th percentile in the entire city. Residents complained about speeding, dangerous driving, and aggressive behavior from the other drivers if you tried to drive the speed limit. Also, apparently, keeping your SUV on a 9 meter wide road was particularly difficult in this area. A pair of painted bike gutters previously existed in the area and residents weren't happy that people on bikes instead chose to ride on the sidewalks. It would be an educated wish to lower the speed limit to 40 km an hour and expect anything to change. The road required major traffic calming measures to reduce speeds and so bike lanes were installed. On just one ride there and back again along the bike lanes, I have to say I'm quite impressed with the lanes. Eastbound, the SUV lane has been narrowed to what looks to be a more standard 3.5 to 4 meters. The white lines marking the bike lane say there's about 2 meters for people on bikes, but the flex posts say there's nearly 5 meters of width, so go ahead and ride side by side. This crosswalk on the west end of the road even looks like people walking can cross the bike lane and then have a refuge before crossing just one of the SUV lanes. I didn't notice that elsewhere along the road, for example here. I think that's due to the bus stops placed right after many of the crosswalks. At this point heading eastward, the bike lane is narrowed while the SUV lane is left very wide, but the frequency of the flex post was increased and there's a painted buffer. Riding westbound isn't quite as nice. Parking was maintained on this section as there are some residences which front onto the street. Flex posts and paint aren't a deterrent to drivers from parking as close as possible to the bike lane and putting part of the bike lane in the door zone. The north side of the road does have the most remarkable thing though. My city actually converted two slip lanes into bike lanes. Even though I think these slip lanes are completely unnecessary, my city deserves quite a bit of praise for actually designating them for people on bikes only. I will always advocate that if you claim to uphold the Vision Zero strategy, you must remove all slip lanes that intersect any active transportation infrastructure. The protected bike lanes were also extended onto 40th Street, though they quickly peter out into painted bike gutters. It was these painted bike gutters that residents previously complained were not being used. I can understand why, as the city, for some reason, painted a wide meridian in the middle of the road which directs drivers to pass people on bikes more closely while still making the road feel very wide and safe for high speeds. And those are the good points about the bike lanes. They're protected, wide, and the slip lanes are now only for people on bikes. The SUV lanes are now much narrower, which should make driving at excessive speeds less comfortable. 
I don't mind the bus stops being in the lanes since the road redesign looks to have been done on a very limited budget. Also, only two buses run along this road. One has a frequency of just every 30 minutes, and the other is a school special that only goes once per day in each direction. There should be very little conflict between buses and people on bikes. As much as I like the bike lanes, they're not perfect, so let's talk about their shortcomings. As mentioned, parking very close to the bike lane is a bit of a problem. Flex posts are better than paint to make a protected bike lane, but they leave a bit to be desired. Maybe some concrete curbs could have been used to keep drivers from parking in the bike lane. There are issues with some of the low curbs being used along part of the bike lane, but I'll get more into that during the controversy part of this video. A second concern is that it's difficult to fix conflicts where drivers need to cross the bike lanes. This driver pulls alongside me before deciding to turn behind me, which I appreciated. Another driver chose to turn in front of me. On distance, this almost felt like a right hook, but I was going slowly due to the 30 km an hour headwind, so the timing wasn't that bad. And then, this person gives a great example of driver entitlement. He not only pulls into the bike lane, but it's also a bus stop at this point. At least he puts on his hazard lights and doesn't door me. But the biggest problem with the bike lane is the connectivity. The new bike lane heading north devolves into the painted bike gutter that was there previously, where people preferred to bike on the sidewalk. The main connections to these new bike lanes are wide sidewalks along some very busy strokes, and that's only part of the connectivity story. In order to preserve the easy flow of SUVs, the bike lanes are cut short by 100 meters or so. It's bizarre how someone decided to just dump some asphalt so close to the intersections and think that's good biking infrastructure. When I first arrived at the bike lanes, I was confused because the wide sidewalk I've been following crosses the slip lane and I could see flex posts ahead. I was actually supposed to follow the old, narrow sidewalk like my friend did. It's only further on that the bike lane actually begins. Overall, I like the bike lanes, but connectivity and the ends are very poor. But, I promised you controversy, and these bike lanes are controversial. In the notes below, I've included two links to news reports about the bike lanes being damaged soon after installation. The news reports are from the beginning of September, and when I rode through on the 1st of October, I could see some damaged curbs. It seems to be just the low, narrow curbs that are being damaged. My city believes it could be intentional, and I would agree. There was something of a symmetry in the damage to the curbs that I saw. I would guess that if a large enough vehicle is driven over the curbs, they will fail, since there's no support underneath where a gap is needed to pick them up with a forklift. The curbs are not high enough or the flex posts rigid enough to dissuade some people from driving over them intentionally and causing the curbs to break. There is also a petition to have the bike lanes removed. As of recording, the petition has been active for three months and has just over 1,700 signatures. Being an online petition, it is difficult for me as an outside observer to know if those 1700 signatures are local residents, residents in the city, or if they're Russian bots. The petition itself is an awesome collection of the usual anti-bike lane arguments and logical fallacies. It starts with the, I live here and things were perfect until the bike lanes were installed, with an appeal to emotion that the bike lanes will destroy the neighborhood. There's then a false dilemma fallacy that paying for the bike lanes means there's no money for road or sidewalk repairs. There's another appeal to emotion, plus a lie that households in the area are some of the poorest in the city, and paying for these bike lanes is an excessive burden. The four census tracts surrounding the bike lanes are very near or in the second quartile, based on after-tax median household income. The lie is that nearby households are paying for the bike lanes. The truth is that the bike lanes are being paid for with money generated through automatic traffic enforcement. There's some poetic justice that speeding drivers are paying for the traffic calming measures. The whole next paragraph is a repeat of earlier arguments. The what we heard document disproves the lack of engagement. The third paragraph also includes the usual argument about a loss of parking. Most of the housing is single family housing with garages and driveways. All the parking was maintained on all the other streets and businesses have their own parking lots. Also, it's not the city's responsibility to allow storage of private vehicles on public streets. The final paragraph has a number of atomistic fallacies. The petition author doesn't ride a bike, so, therefore, no one else does. That means bike lanes are not needed, and people who ride bikes don't own homes. The comments are also pure gold. People are hiding behind the posts. They're an eyesore. I think I showed that pulling over in an emergency is still possible. 
Narrowing roads increases traffic, plus the protected bike lanes bring SUVs and people on bikes closer together. Bike lanes will force you to walk and take transit. The previous wide streets that encouraged speeding, aggressive behavior, and driving off the road were much safer. This is the only comment I can agree with. It's a lot to ask for drivers not to run into the curbs and flex posts when they already have a hard time not running into buildings. Anyway, that's my quick look at some bike lanes that were installed in my city this summer. For a quick and dirty install that didn't rip out any existing pavement or curbs, I really like what was done. Switching the slip lanes to only allow people on bikes was a huge surprise for me. I'm currently doing some advocacy work on another project and the people who bike are pushing for at least one slip lane to be removed. The biggest negative about these bike lanes are that they don't really connect well to other bike lanes at the moment. Maybe that will change in the future. The controversy proves that these lanes are actual biking infrastructure. Drivers actually had something taken away. Drivers love all the wide sidewalks my city has been building elsewhere because they get others off the road and make driving easier. I hope my city builds more lanes like this. They look quick, easy, cheap, and they properly align with Vision Zero goals. They should show if there's latent demand or induced demand for biking in the area. Let me know what you think in the comments below, and thanks for watching.